<laughs> you used to be a wrestler, didn't you? Is that right? I Any still you? am. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm feared in every girls' school in this country. <laughs> in May 1999, TV host and national icon Jimmy Savile appeared on the BBC Two comedy panel show Have I Got News For You. It will be 11 years until his death and 11 years and one month until his many crimes were publicly aired on the same channel. For those unaware of Sir Jimmy Savile, he was a flamboyant national icon of the British Isles. A radio DJ, a television presenter, a charity campaigner, uh, and turns out a man who managed to sexually abuse hundreds of people throughout his life. His crimes raised serious questions about the culture of silence at the state broadcast of the BBC and how his work in pop music, children's television and the NHS made it very easy to perpetrate his many crimes across many decades. Those crimes were an open secret to many and had been since the 60s and his death and subsequent investigation led to many men in television and radio being investigated as part of something called Operation U-Tree. But there are many places in which you can hear about uh, Jimmy Savile's many horrific crimes. We're here because when he died, we heard so much about his life in front of a microphone, his life inside the TV studio, and at the finishing line of many charity marathons that he ran in his life, dressed in his weird crinkly shell suits, puffing on his massive cigars. But wrestling, being wrestling in the UK, a regional concern at best, barely any of the obituaries spoke to his history inside the ring. So, wrestle me are asking the question that probably no one is asking, and perhaps nobody really wanted to ask. Was Jimmy Savile a wrestler? For a few short months, Savile's huge and tasteless granite headstone spent a year looking out over the Scarborough coastline until it was removed under the cover of night, pulverised into dust and put into landfill. It read, Sir Jimmy Savile, OBE, KC, SG, LLD, and listed the achievements for which he wanted to be remembered. Philanthropist, TV presenter, DJ, marathon runner, cyclist, wrestler, and chieftain of Lock Arbor Highland Games. The fact that Jimmy Savile had once been a professional wrestler was well known and referenced often throughout his life, although of all the facets of his career, it's the one that's been least examined since his terrible crimes were exposed. When it was finally revealed that Savile had spent over 50 years as one of the country's most prolific abusers of young children, there were naturally more important questions that had to be asked than but what was his wrestling career like? But the wrestling business had been immensely proud of Savile's former association with their business. Savile remained one of the only true household name celebrities who dabbled in the British grappling business and wrestling continued to milk that association with the sport for years to come. Surprisingly, Savile often publicly returned the affection to his wrestling career, something he seemed incapable of doing with almost anything else in his life. It wasn't showbiz, it wasn't uh, the pop business or anything like that. Wrestling was on a special mountain all of its own, and it was a peak of its time. Jimmy Savile claimed he'd taken part in 107 matches in his career and often stated, it was my proudest claim that I lost my first 35 fights. It wasn't just the years of abuse that Savile hid, but many of the fairly innocuous claims he made publicly often seemed to have no verifiable basis in fact. Everything he said turned out to be, well, suspect. He was almost incapable of telling the truth about any part of his life. So, did Jimmy Savile actually have a legitimate wrestling career, or did he just claim that he did? As a secretive, regionally splintered and primarily working class industry, there's actually no accurate history of British wrestling. It was ignored by most people, there was no demand for its history to be chronicled, so few records were kept, and it largely existed week by week in small venues in front of a few hundred people who enjoyed it while it was on and then forgot all about it. Wrestling was a business which made millions and was beloved by many, but one in which inherently avoided scrutiny and whose true history has largely disappeared into the mist of time. In that way, it actually has many similarities to Savile's own life. According to our research, we have anecdotal accounts that detail matches running from January 1966. Savile's bouts happen frequently for a couple of years before they tail off around about 1968 and finally sputter out in 1972. 
These records aren't in any way exhaustive, and there were definitely more that took place, but nobody had any reason to write them down at all. But because Savile was a famous television star and would become even better known as the years went by, he's actually mentioned in so many memoirs written by British wrestlers. Most of these sightings are largely inconsequential, but Savile does pop up time and time again. What becomes clear is that nobody really knew Savile. Nobody really knew him in anything but the most superficial way. As we made clear after Savile's death, that was the only way anyone actually knew him. In the late 1950s, when he was in his late 20s, and a couple of years away from becoming the television celebrity that made him a household name, Jimmy Savile was the brash, loudmouth manager of the Plaza Ballroom on Oxford Street in Manchester. He'd spent the last few years rising up the ranks in Mecca, a stuffy national dance hall chain who had turned to Savile for his knack of attracting teenagers, which of course back then was a, a demographic that hadn't really existed five years before. Savile was adept at bringing in a teenage crowd. He did this by hosting big disc Scores, which kicked off at the same time as the surrounding school's lunch breaks, playing records imported from America in between the live dance band numbers that they used to put on. Um, he often claimed to have invented the DJ method of playing twin turntables and mixing, but there's really no evidence to suggest that. And appealing to the youngsters with a very unique look, to say the least. Kids had never seen anyone like Savile, and no one in his position had ever paid attention to young people and the entertainment they liked, like Jimmy did. Even at this point of his life, there was something murky about Savile. Much of his life was spent flitting about in the shadows. He famously had uh, troublemakers at his club beaten up in the basement, and he was known locally for his penchant for very young women. We didn't have the word paedophile in them days, said a 16-year-old regular at the plaza, Jimmy Donnelly. We had the word weirdo, and Savile was a weirdo. Working for Mecca, Savile most likely first came into contact with the pro wrestlers who were often employed as bouncers on the doors of clubs and dance halls. One of the pros said to have worked for Savile uh, back then was his fellow Yorkshireman, Shirley Crabtree, a.k.a. Big Daddy. Whenever trouble broke out on the dance floor, Big Daddy would just pick up the miscreants, bundle one under each arm like rolls of carpet and carry them outside. He mostly worked for Savile on the door of the Cat's Whiskers in Leeds. Through the wrestlers, uh, Savile met a man who would later become one of his closest friends. This is Man Mountain Bill Benny. A massive, lisping Henry VIII lookalike, Bill was a fellow club owner and pro wrestler. He debuted in the late 1930s and performed most frequently at the King's Hall in Manchester's Bellevue. A big favourite of the Mancunian crowd, Bill was like a hard-hitting, dirty heel, who outside the ring was incredibly flashy. Here's the Man Mountain himself, with Elvis, trying to book the King for a UK gig that never actually happened. Jimmy found all of this rather alluring, and their relationship grew from there. Benny, of course, wasn't just a promoter and a wrestler, he was also a pimp, and found a member of Manchester's criminal group, the Quality Street Gang, that dominated Northwest crime from the 60s to the 80s. Between us, we were an unbeatable pair, said Savile. Benny would later die one night at the age of 44 after a massive heart attack while being given oral sex. The woman delivering the act was actually trapped under his dead body until they were both discovered the very next day. What became clear was that within hours of the wrestler's death, Jimmy Savile had arrived at Benny's flat. No one knows why he needed to be there so soon after his friend's death, but there were rumours that Jimmy needed to destroy some paperwork that had actually incriminated Jimmy in massive fraud against his own employers. Mecca, who still run bingo halls in pretty much every town in the UK today. Savile would say that he first got in the ring around 1963 at Benny's insistence, which is disputed, but what isn't disputed is that his first wrestling match was against Gentleman Jim Lewis, which took place at one of Benny's clubs. Savile told the author Alan Garfield that uh, at the first fight the crowd was so huge that they were let into the club for free because the police feared a riot outside, and so I got the wrestling bug. Savile never told the same story twice, even about something as irrelevant as to how many people attended a Manchester charity event back in 1963. The charity match between Savile and gentleman Jim Lewis took place at Broughton's Devonshire Sporting Club, a venue that Benny had once owned. Savile wrote about it in his Sunday People column soon after. He was very pleased with his performance. He claimed that he'd spent seven rounds in the air, flying in one direction or another. He actually broke a toe in the process. Build as rest Wrestling's greatest personality, Gentleman Jim Lewis, held the British welterweight title for a decade. 
but was then blackballed after trying to form a union for wrestlers, which does sound familiar. At the time he made his wrestling debut against Aging Lewis, the 35-year-old Savile had actually moved from Manchester over the Pennines to run Mecca's Locarno Ballroom in his hometown of Leeds and become a huge star with his pop show on Radio Luxembourg. It had an audience of over 6 million listeners. The wrestling commentator Kent Walton was also a DJ on that station, although it's unclear if they knew each other. It was clear why wrestling might want Savile. He was a big star, both locally and increasingly nationally, and was a draw on any bill he appeared on. Promoter Max Crabtree said, He wasn't bad, Jimmy. He didn't have the physical attributes, thin and wiry, but he was box office magic. Jimmy would put himself out for you. His entrance music was Twist and Shout by the Beatles. As Savile also had his own newspaper column in the National Press, where he portrayed himself as hopefully out of his depth in these wrestling bouts, making the wrestlers seem like genuine tough guys that he stood no chance against. But why was Savile so interested in wrestling when he had so much more lucrative work in his calendar? Well, it could have been that it was a way of ingratiating himself with some tough men who could come in handy if there were issues with anyone trying to muscle in on his venue or, in turn, parents of young women who wanted to have a word with Savile. It presented him as a man's man, someone not to be messed with. And he undoubtedly loved the publicity that wrestling gave him, making him a bigger and more lucrative star. But perhaps there was something about wrestling, a sport in which you fool the audience, where you present the version of events you want them to believe and never reveal the actual truth that appealed to Jimmy Savile on a darker level. Either way, the demographics of the wrestling fan would mean it gave him access to people that he would prey on. Wrestling allowed him to turn up in a new town, earn money, see what he could do for fun, and then be gone the moment the fun stopped, or when things entirely turned bad. The lifestyle enabled him to just flit across the whole of the Northwest like a malevolent shadow. In his book, You Grunt, I'll Grown, legendary wrestling star Jackie Palo spoke of the Ring Rats. In his words, a wrestling's equivalent of the pop world's groupies. It was said by Palo to be strictly taboo to take a girl out who was under 16, and it's up to the man to make sure whether she was or not. If anyone broke this rule, he would get a heavy sorting out from the others for several weeks. When this was told to Savile in an interview in the 2000s, Savile nodded along and then subsequently refused to talk about wrestling anymore. Savile's first bout attracted the attention of the promoter and 1930s wrestler George Relviscow, who had recently served with the SAS during World War II, suffering injuries from a landmine that ended his wrestling career. Setting up as a promoter after the war, Rel Ruscow and business partner Arthur Green controlled a pretty large section of North West England from their base in Leeds with a handful of venues in the Midlands and Scotland too. They were a key part of the joint promotions monopoly of promoters who carved up England and Scotland, put on some 40 to 50 shows a week, rotated talent and threatened to blackball any wrestlers who worked for non-joint organisations and of course kept their performers' wages low. The cabal of promoters running joint promotions retained their iron grip on British wrestling for decades. Rowescow and Green were known as reliable but rather conservative promoters. Their cards were always good but never exceptional, but seeing the reaction Savile was receiving, Rowescow signed the 40-year-old untrained nightclub manager to a lucrative five-year contract. Relwiskow had managed to land one of Britain's fastest rising entertainment stars. By the end of 1965, Savile was comparing the Beatles' Christmas shows and hosting Top of the Pops on the BBC. Les Kellett, a British star we featured on our channel before, trained Jimmy Savile to wrestle. Of Kellett, Savile said, He gave up his evenings to show me a few holds and how not to fall on my head. When you hit Les with a forearm, it was like hitting Leeds Town Hall. In 1966, the year that police would later pinpoint as the start of Jimmy's decade-long peak period of abuse, Savile had his first professional bout. Here he is awaiting his opponent, Chick Purvey, in the Queen's Hall in Leeds. Here's some of the only footage of Savile wrestling, and it was against Purvey. It doesn't appear to be his debut because Savile's hair is bleached, which actually came later in his career. Speaking of which, in 2016, the inquiry into Savile's abuse on BBC premises reported on the case of one victim named C32, who believed she'd been raped by Savile at Lime Grove Studios in 1959. She'd not recognised Savile until some years later, and had claimed that her attacker actually had dark hair. 
The inquiry report stated that Savile had already started bleaching his hair, never allowing it to return to its original colour, but there are photos of him wrestling in 1966 with dark hair. And by the inquiry, not paying attention to his documented years in wrestling means that the official record in this country needlessly casts doubt onto a witness's statement. In March, Savile beat Peter Preston by disqualification in Hull. April, he fought Pervy in Scarborough, the results not known, before beating Peter Preston in Sheffield by a pinfall. It was here that, according to Jimmy, an old lady had tried to stick a metal spiked umbrella into one of Preston's thighs. As with many of Savile's stories, this kind of seems unlikely, as Preston was the babyface at the time and Savile was the bad guy. I was getting a good hard in, in Sheffield one time and suddenly I got quite a pain in my thigh. And I looked round and there's a lady wielding an umbrella with a metal spike at the bottom of it. And she'd prodded me and I said, ooh, what was that for, love? And she says, no, not you, Jimmy, him, him. <laughs> Savile lost again to Pervy in July, this time at the Manchester Bellevue, where Bill Benny had fought so often. Alan Dennison in October up in Scarborough. Ivan Pensakoff in November in Morecambe before he finished the year with another DQ win over Preston in Newcastle to admittedly rave reviews. What becomes clear looking at some of these matches was that Savile wasn't working as a jobbing wrestler. He was actually the special attraction. His promoters would have him fight then move him on to another part of the country immediately because his shtick was kind of limited. He'd come into the ring as a flamboyant, wealthy outsider thinking he was the bee's knees before comprehensively getting his arse handed to him by a real man. It was Kaufman-esque, really. But even though he was delighting the promoters, the wrestlers didn't really want a Savile for obvious reasons. Not because of his behaviour outside of the ring, but because so many of them were asked to wrestle this unathletic, green skeleton man with a weird page boy haircut who was making more money playing records sat on his behind every week than most of them would make in a year and the wrestlers hated that as 1967 rolled around Savile started to compete on a much more regular basis in January Savile beat Eric Cutler by DQ in Huddersfield stopped Chick Purvey in Newcastle teamed with the legendary Jackie Palo in Leeds to beat Alan Dennison and Chick Purvey by disqualification and finally tangled with Purvey again in Harrogate while he's often worked with Pervy in this period, his Leeds appearance saw him team with Palo, a huge star in what was the main event of the night. Palo hated Savile. In February, he had eight bouts against Eric Cutler, Steve Logan and Alan Dennison all around the country. In March, he beats Pervy in Leicester, is KO'd by Steve Logan in Rotherham, wrestles to a one-all draw with Cutler in Leeds and meets Pervy again in Bridlington. The bill for this show, headlined by the French Teddy Boys against Leon Arras and Ian Gilmore, was one that had pride of place on the wall of Savile's flat, overlooking Roundhay Park in Leeds, a home that was demolished in 2014. In April, he was wrestling again in Manchester, Nottingham. In May, he headed north of the border for a bout against Chick Purvey up in Edinburgh. It was there that Savile met a 17-year-old local beauty queen who accompanied him to the ring in a bikini. In a scene typical of Sir Jimmy, he invited her to see Top of the Pops being filmed the very next day. And it was actually there that she met the BG singer Barry Gibb, and they have been married ever since. Not that Gibb would ever admit Jimmy had a hand in it. 1967 would be Savile's busiest year in wrestling, a conservative estimate of over 28 bouts. But it was also the year when his mainstream career took off and wrestling was left behind. In June, Savile started his new show on BBC Radio 1, treating himself to a new Rolls Royce with 18 karat gold handles, launched a new quiz show on BBC One and continued as the face of Top of the Pops. Savile will be spotted a couple of times in the wrestling ring, training with Shoza Kobayashi in a gym in Leeds, but it was around about this time that he started the charity fundraising that would make him untouchable and more ominously became a voluntary porter in Leeds General Infirmary, both of which gave him unmetered and unsupervised access to young people. Savile's connection with numerous hospitals would last until the end of his life and provided him with both a captive audience and easy pickings. He didn't need wrestling anymore. Most of his time was now taken up with public fundraising and private horror. Jimmy Savile barely wrestled in 68, 69 and 70, but in 1971 he returned to the ring not as a villain, but as a hero. Jimmy Savile was by now a very famous and respectable man indeed, but that was not how his opponents saw it. Exotic Adrian Street was a flamboyant Welsh wrestler whose frills and flounces disguised the fact he was unbelievably tough and incredibly aggressive. 
A hard-hitting dynamo, his violent style was developed in part to try to detract from his relatively small stature of just five foot six. But make no mistake about it, Street was also just naturally violent. It's what made him a good wrestler. Having spent years pulling himself up the card with a mixture of intensity and, well, chippiness, and finding himself in the middle of the best run of his career, he was rendered speechless by the very idea that he'd be forced to fight Jimmy Savile. He was even more shocked when the promoter Ted Beresford said he wanted them to go to a draw. This is a promoter, right, who'd been a professional wrestler himself, Ted Beresford. I mean, come on. And because he's a big name and all the rest of it at that time, Promoter comes in, he says, Adrian, I want you to do he, he said, you're wrestling with Jimmy Savile. I said, you're kidding. He said, no. He said, he said, I want you to do a draw. I want, you to, I want you to do a draw and match with him. I don't want him beat. He's asking me to do that. I said, you've got to be bloody joking. Street refused to look at Savile when it was time to disrobe, turning his back on him. When he heard the crowd roar, Street assumed Savile had taken his robe off, so he removed his own gown. But when Street turned round, Savile had a surprise up his sleeve. Underneath the robe he'd just taken off, Savile had a second, fancier robe. And as Street fumed, Savile strutted around, performing uh, an impression of Adrian Street, before removing the second gown to reveal a third one. The fans were going crazy for it, recalled Street. Unfortunately for Savile, though, Adrian Street Street didn't quite see it like that. What followed was Jimmy Savile's most famous match, but not for the reasons he probably would have wanted. Street exploded into Savile with a drop kick, which turned him upside down before he landed on top of his head on the mat. Surprisingly, though, Savile leapt up and attempted a drop kick of his own. Street grabbed his feet and threw them high into the air, which caused him once again to land on top of his head. <laughs> Savile popped up again, at which point Street hit him with another drop kick. Each time Savile came at him, Street would just beat the living crap out of him with some rather strong work, to say the least. The match has become the most famous of Savile's career, more so in recent years, as knowing what we know now. It's been celebrated as one of the few times that Savile got a tiny sliver of justice meted out to him in the form of a beating. In 2013, the by then 72-year-old Adrian Street told Wales Online that while he'd absolutely crucified Savile, he'd have done even more if he'd have known what sort of man he was. But, you know, at that time we didn't know. He used to come in the dressing room and boast about all the girls that were lining up at his apartment. And, I mean, he boasted they were young girls, but we didn't realise how bloody young. We didn't realise they were children. While the match with Adrian Street is wildly thought of as Savile's last wrestling match, he did actually have one more six months later, in January 1972, the same month that he was actually awarded an OBE for his services to charity. He actually wrestled Leon Arras in Halifax, winning his final recorded bout by disqualification. Arras was better known as the actor Brian Glover, and by this time he'd made his name in acting with his astonishing turn as a PE teacher in the film Kez. He also played a wrestler in the TV show that myself and Mark reviewed some months ago, Rumble. Rumble's a bad TV show. Well? Not good. Terrible. Catastrophic, but it's early days yet. In December 1992, the WWF domination of Britain continued as Roddy Piper appeared on Jim Will Fix It, granting a wish of a lad called John who wanted to get into the ring with the World Wrestling Federation champion. Uh, the production crew clearly messed that one up because uh, Piper had left WWF by that time and uh, he'd also never been the WWF champion. So there you go. So Jimmy Savile died in October 2011 and as his gravestone put it, it was good while it lasted. Chilling. But the culture of silence in which he'd operated wouldn't last much longer. In late 2012, Dame Journey Smith's report into Savile's abuse uh, within the BBC, which criticised the culture of silence inside the company. Uh, and even though most people behind the scenes didn't like him, in fact many found him actively repellent, they worked with Savile and promoted him because he attracted big ratings and big audiences always turned out to see him. And as we said at the start of this video, uh, obviously was Jimmy Savile actually a wrestler? Uh, was probably quite Quite far down the list of questions when a man who committed near to 600 counts of sexual misdemeanors but it was that transient lifestyle of a wrestler for some 10 years that surely must have added to these opportunities continuous unrecorded travel mainly at night surrounded by children wrestling by its very nature is kind of like a traveling fun fair here for one night 
then they're out of town. They're gone. Perfect for someone like Jimmy Savile. Jimmy Savile's years spent in professional wrestling received barely any mention in the stories in the newspapers about Savile's sinister life. It's as if his time in wrestling, which weirdly coincided with his most prolific years as a rapist, was unworthy of examination purely because it was wrestling. And it's galling to think that he was one of the very few famous people who celebrated professional wrestling publicly, which obviously confirms everyone's biases about the wrestling business. Namely that it's it's dark, it's sordid, where transient and predatory people just mess around for an idiotic, cretinous crowd. There was an echo of this dismissal uh, back in 2020 when the Speaking Out movement revealed the uh, massive extent of sexual abuse in modern British wrestling. Uh, While it was a far-reaching scandal, it was barely covered by any of the newspapers or the news outlets, the television stations, because British wrestling was still so far from the mainstream that anything happening within it remains largely irrelevant to the wider world. As he did in all aspects of his life, Savile once again tricked everyone watching him. Everyone knew Savile was the bad guy, they just never understood how truly bad he was. He seemed like a figure of fun. He seemed like a laugh. He seemed like someone who wrestling could be proud of. And he turned out to be none of those things. But there's something cruelly ironic about his time in wrestling. A place where rough and ready moral tales underpin every single bout. In wrestling, the bad guys always eventually get their comeuppance. And good, ultimately, always triumph. In real life, things don't always end up like the wrestling. So this video was based on the October 2021 uh, special WrestleMe newsletter written entirely by Mark Haynes. Um, you can get the newsletter from patreon.com forward slash WrestleMe. Uh, you've got ad-free versions of the videos from the WrestleMe YouTube channel and a brand new podcast every single week. We're going to be back next time with some stuff that's not about this.